are you still laying in bed? Hey, buddy. Hey. How are you? I'm great, man. How are you? Good. No, no, no laying in bed. I was just talking to my mom. She says hi, by the way. Yeah, tell, I, I totally forgot this, but tell your mom I said happy birthday. Yes, I will. You know, you know our moms share the same birthday, right? Oh, that's right, yeah. I know, I totally forgot that, and Allie reminded me uh, this morning that our moms share. How old is your mom? Oh, she's getting up there. Yeah, you don't even know how old she is, do you? No, I don't. Uh, oh, Michael. But I don't, I don't pay attention to people's age because I, I like to forget about it sometimes. Uh, that's true. Well, you know, I, I can see that. She's just a youthful, loving, energetic, beautiful woman. That's how I see her. Is she still in the same room? Yes. No, okay, she, that's what I thought. No, <laughs> yeah, tell your, yeah, tell your mom I said the same thing. Yeah, my mom turned uh, 60 on Sunday. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, which is which I sometimes forget that you and my mom are actually closer in age than you and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, just remember that wisdom piece. When she, uh, yeah, no, I think my mom's 71, 72. She nice. was, yeah, 71. Ish. 70-ish, yeah. So you had a pretty, before we rock into these awesome uh, emails we got, you had a pretty big, big weekend, huh? Yeah, I did. I was at the uh, Beloit International Film Festival here in Wisconsin, and uh, our documentary, Saving Banks, he won best feature documentary so that was cool yeah it's been a it's been busy there's been a lot of uh acclaim around it uh we released itunes on friday and on that same day banksy unveiled his new exhibit in bethlehem and got worldwide press it was incredible oh was that planned timing or just (laughs) i i i text our uh executive producer brian i said can you believe that this released on the exact same day and he said yeah i called him last night and told him to drop it I was like, yeah, whatever. So we don't know him. No, so I don't know. You know, it it all comes back to, uh, you know, I'm sure he knew about it through the people in the film or whatever, but I just mm-hmm. can't believe that, you know. But then again, you know, he's a real savvy uh, he artist. He is. So <laughs> it's, uh, it would make sense if, if, in fact, he was looking for publicity, which That's awesome. would be hard to believe he isn't on some level. But I mean, we all are on some level. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, awesome. are you sure you want to do this? Because that dog cast is really taking off. Yeah, I know. I'm kind of nervous <laughs> that, that we're going to put out like a legitimate like effort to, you know, get back on track and with the emails we got. And I'm, I'm still fear, uh, fearful that your dog cast is going to get more downloads than the one we're about to do. I know it. But, you know, just like I <sighs> Yeah, that would be a bummer. But I think that if we if that happens, then I think maybe we'll just have to intermittently add dog casts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's if or, if if or anything else, it's a it's a great way to get free downloads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, we can we can cushion we can cushion uh, cushion our stats a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm I'm all, I'm all for that. Yeah, obviously. Ima- <laughs> I just was laughing. Can you imagine if like first time listeners to the podcast and that's the first yeah we probably <laughs> we probably gained and lost a lot of new listeners this morning. Uh, so uh, yeah, but oh, we uh, the uh, Crushing Iron Squad had a great weekend as well. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. A I survived my weekend with the in laws mm-hmm. and. Yeah, we had some really awesome performances. I think we had a we had a second overall at a 10k race. Oh, uh, yeah, really? Big up, overall? Yeah, yeah, overall. Big ups to Chris Gerard for uh, running strong, and then Lisa Kelly with a uh, she won her age group, and then at the Tom King and uh, part of the Golden Girl Squad, and Rebecca Appleton had a seven minute plus PR on her half marathon. Wow, uh, that included uh, vomiting between miles nine and ten no and yes it does <laughs> is yeah. this public knowledge man or it is, is this, this like... public knowledge okay uh well i mean public as far as it uh, is now yeah, it is now yeah uh <laughs> and, and joanne Langton had another had a great half marathon as well so yeah we had the, the squad had a great running weekend for sure that's right uh, now can, good job by chris on that second overall and what about we got to throw a shout out to his podcast yeah, yeah, Chris Lower. and uh, Chris and Lena Burrow have a great podcast, uh, Lost in uh, in Transition. So if you haven't listened to it, uh, take a listen. They always have great guests on there, and they don't give you ultimatums and like make you listen to to stuff. Although if they did it, it would be about cats. 
<laughs> so, you know, I'm just saying. I know, I think Lane is a cat person. I think Chris said he has a cat, too. So, um, okay. yeah. Polar opposite podcasts in that one of us loves dog and the other ones love cats. Cat cast. I don't know. It just doesn't ring. It doesn't ring like dog cast. No, no, no. And I was, I, yeah. I was about to drop a, a name I would call it, but I don't think it's good for uh, oh, the airwaves. No, it's not. Uh, yeah, definitely. Hey, uh, we got a lot of email. We did. And actually, we've legitimately gone over our limit now, or our request yes. goal. So, um, I know you wanted to talk about some of them. I kind of just was reading through some of them. I've really been behind and catching up, and they're they were um, really good. People were sharing some really good stories about. They're just. I think that no uh, you know, I and loved it. Pretty heavily split. Uh, so if you emailed us, thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to spend some time today to go back and respond individually to each of you. But they were they were very much split. Like uh, half were kind of person. Uh, human interest stories, I feel like, and the other half was like, hey, I'd love to hear more about this. But yeah. I, I, I love hearing both. You know, I love, and I feel like we just got great content for like the next month. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, like, we know what we want to talk about because it's inter- interesting to us, but it's hard to kind of filter out, all right, well, what do other people want to listen to or, or you know, and, and hear about and have us discuss? And so now it's it's been really great for me, at least, to get feedback and um, you know, constructive criticism and, and what things we can do better, but then also, you know, like areas that we've helped, but also what people want to hear more about. So yeah, th- there's a lot of great topics uh, today and I, um, we can definitely start going over a few of them. Yeah. I, I, I know one of them was, uh, well, the one I was reading, it was about, they want more about the run. Now, is that what you're thinking? I mean, are you reading the same stuff I am? Obviously you are, but what, how are you looking at it? I read. Oh, I read all of them for okay. the most part, word for word. But I, uh, um, I was going to start with the first email we got and go uh, and go down those. So yeah, I mean, so if the four pretty major topics I got was one, you know, how do you approach multi day events mm-hmm. uh, like people who want to do something like the Disney Challenge or I mean, I, I for me specifically, I've got an athlete this year doing um, the Triple T, which is a which is like you know the one of the more well known back to back race weekends yeah. uh, that there is in the u s and then I'm also going to do like a a three day stage race for running as prep for Leadville, so um, that's definitely something that we can talk about um, also, I thought it was interesting um, you know is applying to like how do you deal with a uh, participating or like going to an adult well this this person put adult tri camp in quotes but um if you are an age group and you go to one of these higher profile you know tri camps for like three or four days when usually it's just like a massive uptick in volume and how and how to deal with that and then yeah we got um some more requests for how to not suck at running and cycling uh and then let's see what else do we get Oh, and then another great one I thought uh, was um, a request for topics on training with an injury, uh, which obviously, uh, to reword it, it's not to train uh, through an injury. It's more to how to manipulate your training so you don't lose all of your fitness. Um, I think this person was kind of saying, hey, if I have this part of my uh, workouts shelved, how to, how can I monitor this? And I've, I've dealt with it personally and I have had athletes, uh, deal with it. Um, and it, it's a, it's a very careful manipulation of, of give and take and patience. And so, no, I mean, that's a lot of awesome content. So I'll let you pick from that quick drop down menu and then we'll shoot from there. Okay, cool. Yeah. I got your stuff here. Uh, you want to just go through it then, man? Yeah, yeah, I think we'll start with the the first one. The, for the first email we got was a question about preparing for and racing multi day events. So uh, I've got input yeah. on that right away. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, uh, don't do it. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Ask for your uh, your refund immediately. Um, no, I mean this is something that's becoming like 
running wise has always been popular in cycling with stage races and events and um you know the the disney is a big um is a big one as well when when that's just like just running um but you know a very very popular one is what they call the triple t Mm-hmm. Um, and the triple T I believe is in, it's in Ohio. I actually have an athlete doing it this year. And, um, on Friday you do a sprint, uh, Saturday you do, um, an Olympic and a sprint. Um, what? and then Sunday, yeah. And then Sunday, or excuse me, you do an Olympic and then Sunday you do a half. Um, so basically it's four races within a weekend. So you're actually going to do a Friday super sprint at the given time, Saturday morning, uh, you're going to do one race Saturday evening, do a second race. And then the race number four is on Sunday. Um, and, and I don't even like to call these races because there are so many things to take into consideration that it, yes. Is it ultimately a race? Absolutely. Um, do I think you should kind of treat, treat it as a race? Probably not. Um, and, and, I, and I've done some more research into this as I've kind of gone through my training and knowing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the Chattanooga three-day stage race in June. Um, and in the way I like to, to approach it with my athletes is you need to look at the event as, it's, as, a, as an accumulative event, mm-hmm. not specific days. Um, you know, a couple things are really, really important when you focus on this. Recovery is paramount. <laughs> uh, how you recover from the next day to the next day to the next. Uh, re- um, warming up, also huge, a huge um, deal when you're working on stiffness and back to back to back days. But to be totally honest with the the person who asked this and, and all the listeners who have considered doing a um, an event like this is, I actually think they're, they're very, very achievable. Um, it's, it's, do you have the patience to understand that you're not racing on Friday, you're competing for Sunday. Okay. And, and and that's a different, that's a difficult thing for people to wrap their mind around, especially in, I mean, a triathlon is a great example because people really get caught up in cycling. Uh, and they will blow their load on the bike, and it's really hard to a not blow your load on the bike, and then be like, okay, "Do I have enough left in the tank for the run?" But as a competitor, myself is I'm a great example because I'm a great swimmer, an average biker, and then a, and then a, a well above average runner. It's really hard not to want to go on the bike when you see somebody pass you. Mm-hmm. You don't want to go. You want to go. You want to go. And you have to think about the end of the race and not where you are within the race. Okay. And and that's a very, very important aspect for people to always remember, just in, even on single-day events. I remember the first time I finally got the grasp of, um, of that uh, – uh, patience, I guess, is what you call it. and and co- patience and confidence. I, th- I think they both come together. Uh, was Gulf Coast Triathlon like 2013? I think um, I was. I, I really, really it was. A, it, it, Gulf Coast is a 70.3. It's Ironman Brendan now, but I was really, really going for a top 10 finish overall. Mm-hmm. And these these two or three guys all passed me in the last home stretch like last five miles and all, I mean, and my first instinct was, Oh, you better go, you know, because, it, and, and I, but I was like, you know what? You've been running really, really well. It was like uh, three weeks post country music marathon where I had ran really well. And I was like, you know what? I'll see you guys on the run. Mm-hmm. And I think I passed the first one in the, the first one in mile one, the second one in mile two and ate up the other three um, and ran my way into a top 10 overall finish. Um, I didn't get passed once on the run by anybody. Probably my best run today. But I th- that was that moment, which is the same thing in a in a stage race or a back to back race. Where <sighs> yes, in the moment, do I want to chase you and feel good right now, or do I want to be able to function on Saturday or Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, and and chase them. And do does the time matter? Absolutely. But always ask yourself, weigh it: the time I'm gaining now versus the time I could lose 
later. Yeah. Now I've got a couple of questions about yeah. these because I'm not that familiar with these stage races either. Um, but the, so you're going for your overall combined time. That's how they, is that what the deal is? Yep. Yep. It's very much tour de France, tour de France like. Okay. So yep. yeah, that's another obvious reason to <laughs> keep it level and save stuff. But secondly, um, as you were describing how this works, it seems to me like this might be a good way to sort of like test the water to see uh, or to train and or see if you're ready for a full in a way. Yeah, yeah it, it definitely is. And it, I think it's more um, apt to tell you if you're ready to actually train for a full. Yeah, I guess that's what I was getting at. Because, you know, it, it's all cumulative. And you're obviously you're very familiar with the way that I train my athletes for a full distance mm-hmm. is I don't ever have you do epic days. You know, I don't have you do these humongous brick workouts. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a 72 hour fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I want you to cover the distance over 72 hours, you know, and that usually looks like a super, you know, and I, I usually put it in probably four weeks or five weeks out. Friday is a, is a massive swim where you're going to swim well over the distance. Um, and you might do like a, a real easy, easy recovery spin later in the day. The next day, it's a, a, a probably close to, if not the the distance on the bike. It's more about time. So you're looking at a five to six hour bike, uh, depending on terrain, depending on where you are in your training, and depending on the course. Um, and with with a very short run um, afterwards. And then on the Sunday, you're either going to have a long run. If your body usually withstands that very, very well, if you're a younger athlete, if you're not injury prone, um, if you're very durable, if you're not, then that Sunday run is more likely going to be a split run, where there would be an hour and a half in the morning and an hour in the evening. You're still getting two and a half hours. Well, if you combine it all together, you're going to have pretty close to 140.6. You're you're definitely not going to have the 26.2, but you're going to have about three hours of running over a 24-hour span all of the biking and all of the running or all of the swimming. Yeah. Uh, and so that's definitely much more representative of what it's going to feel like, um, on a stage race. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I, it, it took me a while to figure out that's what you're doing that one time at, uh, the first year we were training. I was like, wait, I think I went to you the next on Monday. I said, dude, yeah, that makes sense. Like I just did the race, but you gave me a little time to recover. Yeah, and you give you a little bit of time to recover, but you're also doing it on already fatigued legs. Yes. And a fatigue system with no rest. You know, so take away like because usually this is at the end of your last block. So you've just done like a two or three week really, really big block, probably no days off, and you nail this three day seventy two hour Ironman window and you're totally you're very, very fatigued. And now take like a two week taper on fresh legs. It makes everything totally doable. It's yeah. easier to wrap your mind around. Yeah. Um, so if you think about it, um, that's always the biggest question. Like people go into race day going, "Man, I've never even come close to doing this distance." But if you reflect and look at it like that, then you should be able to have a little more confidence on race day. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think stage races in general, people do them for the experience. Mm-hmm. Not not for necessarily to race. I mean, I'm sure some people do, but it's just a great experience. You learn a lot. It, first of all, I think it's just a neat environment to put yourself in. Um, but I think you learn also a lot about yourself and your body and how you can adapt and um, get, kind of getting up on a sore day and working your way through it. Because uh, you know, most of the time, you're going to end up feeling better towards the end than when you started. Mm. That's just that's just how it goes. Um, and this, the second part of that first question was, you know, um, which kind of goes to the same application is, you know, these athletes this time of year, it, a lot of people, it's very popular to go to like a triathlon camp this time of year. You got to Arizona, you got Tucson's a really popular place right now to hit up a, a triathlon camp when, it, it, first of all, it's, a, it's an incredible experience. Um, I've never done one before. It's, it's, I've always liked to, but it's, you got to, it's, it ain't cheap. Um, and you know, this is also something you can kind of do at home or do with your buddies. You know, it's like, you know, do your own camp, but, um, where you really 
up the volume. Uh, this question was about upping the volume and intensity to really high levels, but and it's same same incorporated from the stage races. And intensity isn't really usually a, a huge focus of these camps. It's just putting in a ton of volume. Um, and just like any other aspect of training, when you approach volume, you also need to approach recovery just as serious. Um, because I, there are a lot of athletes who go to these camps and have an, an unbelievable experience, and they are unable to capitalize on this huge gained fitness of super compensation and upped volume because they get back and they got to go to work and they got kids and they got responsibilities. And oh crap, I forgot to get like more sleep and eat better and recover so I can absorb all of that fitness and training. Um, and a lot of times you'll see athletes come out of it sick and depleted and, and uh, overtrained because they don't they take uh, while it is a wonderful experience and that's something you can't be replaced, you really go for the boost in fitness. And if you really want that boost in fitness, you also have to take into account um, the recovery and how important it is. So you can uh, you know, if you want to get a lot of water out of the sponge, you got to squeeze it hard first and then soak it up. You know, and a lot of athletes just don't take that into consideration. They just think that fitness just comes with fitness, but fitness only comes with rec- with recovery. Yeah, and are, aren't a lot of these things just big party weekends? Uh, it probably for some. You know, I, th- I think a lot of people. It's just it's a huge business now. Like just these triathlon camps. I've, I've always wanted to host one. Um, and I think it'd be pretty fun, uh, pretty fun weekend. But it's it's a lot of volume, and you know, getting away. You learn a lot. Uh, you train with some hopefully cool people. But um, yeah, you know, the, the, at some point here in the next year or two, we'll definitely have a, a crushing iron triathlon camp in uh, probably Sarasota or something, really? uh, Florida. Sarasota. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, my family's got a condo down there. Uh, we can do a lot of open water swimming. And uh, you won't get any hills in Sarasota, but um, that's fine with yeah. me. Yeah, for sure, right? Um, so the next question, and we're I'm going to really briefly gloss over these, and then probably go definitely into the uh, some of them a little bit deeper on the next podcast. But uh, the next one was just, hey, how do I not suck at running and biking? Um, you know, those are definitely two very very deep. Uh, subjects that i can go into uh, i'll kind of gloss over quickly them today and then we'll definitely release a how to not suck at cycling part two down the road here shortly and then um although we have done a run focused podcast before we can do our first how to not suck at running yeah uh, i'm looking forward podcast. to that yeah, yeah. um because you know that's one that i've always i i love uh you know i have athletes I had one recently, you know, Hey, do you coach just runners? Absolutely. You know, I've got a lot of run- people that do just running events. I have somebody going for Boston in April. Who's just a runner. Um, you know, and, and running, and I'll start with that is <laughs> running is, um, running is of, of all three sports is one where, uh, you know, if, if I broke them down, I would say swimming is the one where I have to really convince people to be interested um, and to find huge gains because people just don't like to swim. Mm-hmm. But once they, once they get it and once they find themselves interested, then they just like go berserk and they just see ridiculous gains. Um, and I will give a quick shout out to Blake, uh, Ogle, who is a previous guest. Uh, he did a swim like last week, I think, uh, where he averaged like one thirty sixes for the whole hour. Wow. And about and about 13 months ago when he started with me, his first swim was a 2000 and he averaged 207s. Wow. Um, and so but he now he loves swimming obviously by the fact that he's doing uh swim the suck, but that that's a case of becoming really interested in an event. And swimming is something where I don't have to worry about people overtraining because it's a non-force. Uh cycling is one where you have to go through more uh specifics with an athlete as far as, you know, high RPM, low RPM, uh, when to push threshold, when to not, uh, running is where you really have to teach patience. Um, 
people want to overrun all the time. And I mean overrun in the opposite way. They don't want to run enough. They just want to run a little, and they run a, and they want to run hard <laughs> when, when they run. And if they could just totally reverse that and say, I would, I would, I'd rather just run a lot and just run a lot slower, you'd become a, an infinitely faster runner. Hmm. Um, I usually have to, I really have to slow people down, and when they, when I, when I start with them, and usually it just takes the first race. We're like, oh. <laughs> Okay, I guess this works. Um, because you can accumulate more. It's like running is all about accumulation, and you know that's just. Uh, we'll cover that in the, in the next podcast. But if you haven't listened to our our other previous podcasts about how swimming helps you run, but also uh, running slower to get faster, definitely listen to that uh, podcast as kind of a pre a prerequisite for how to not suck at running. Um, but running is much more a, uh, in my opinion, a quantity versus quality. Um, you know, 80% of the time you need to be running chill, slow, uh, patiently. And then when it's time to run hard, you can actually run hard and still get up and run the next day. Mm. Um, cycling, cycling is, is, is tough because, what I've found with, and I'm dealing with this with a current athlete, is, is different people respond to different stimuluses um, in like totally drastic ways. So I have some athletes who respond really, really well to lots of like threshold work. Um, they can recover quickly, they can do a lot of them. And then I have other athletes, especially like this in particular is a real demanding job. He's got two young kids. And um, although he wants to really slam it, what we've kind of found is, is his, the way his body works. And this is much the way my body works. From a physiological standpoint, he is better at absorbing a lot than getting pounded with a little, okay. if, if, that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so he would, he's better off from an adaptation standpoint and a can, and on a continuum standpoint, me giving him seven hours of cycling broken down as six hours of easy zone one, zone two stuff, only an hour spread out of hard versus athlete B who could probably get away with four hours of training and two and a half to three hours of those being hard. Okay. Um, and, and that's just learning about your body learning about how you adapt. If you're getting run down a lot, then let's roll it back. Um, but cycling is, um, it's a lot like running in, in the way that you want to train, you want to train way above or you want to train way below. And that goes with RPM. I always have my athletes, like if you're have an average cadence of 80, I'm going to have you do a lot of big gear stuff, uh, at like 55, 60, or we're going to do a lot of high RPM stuff. Um, so we're never going to just do, all right, let's just do 80 because that's what you're already good at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so we, we want to fine tune your pedal stroke. We want to fine tune, um, the, the muscular, uh, specificity. We want to, we want to make sure everything is firing on all cylinders while also really, really creating a, a great adaptation to where, uh, you become stronger without just killing yourself. Okay. Um, so you, you never kind of hang out in that middle, which is the same for training intensity distribution. I'm not going to have you train 80% of the time at race pace. It's either going to be way below or it's going to be way above. Um, because way below, we can do a lot of it. Way above, we can do a little bit of it, but you're going to need so much recovery in between that you can still get back the next day. And we've talked about this before, is race pace is that pace where I can do it for a much longer time today, but the recovery from it because of that is going to be so much longer. I'm going to do a detriment to my training two, three, four days afterwards. So is it really worth it today? Oh, um, interesting. Yes, same application for what we talked about previously in, in, in racing. You know, Is what I'm doing right now going to – gain me more time right right now and is it worth me slowing me down later um so yes does your does your 10 mile tempo run at race pace feel really good today yep but are you going to be able to run well or even bike well the next couple of days probably not 
are you going to be able to do like a, a high threshold cycling workout today at race pace for two hours? Sure. Will it feel good? Absolutely. Will it give you confidence? Uh, definitely. Are you going to be able to be worth a crap for the next three or four days? Nope. <laughs> so, so are you sacrificing a day for five? Um, you know, and then that could be applied, you know, to a lot of things. Um, let's see. Go on to the next one. I know we're covering a lot of ground here, but we'll go into the, more of this uh, in depth. I think the last one um, was about injuries, uh, which is which is a great um, which is a great topic. Uh, I think this person was more so, um, you know, not being able to run for a couple weeks a month, and I I kind of came into a unique uh, circumstance. Uh, earlier in the season, I picked up an athlete, uh, who was already injured. Okay. Um, she came into our coach athlete relationship with a probable, uh, stress fracture. Um, so yeah, definitely a unique way to start your coaching, uh, relationship. Um, I had her go to the doctor obviously, and she, uh, it came out that she was actually, uh, did have a stress fracture. So, okay, we're going to start it off with, <laughs> with a definite, uh, you know, an, starting off with an injured athlete is something I've never done before. Having said that, running is one of those things that, yes, people feel like they're going to lose it like super quick. And, you know, yes, you will, but there, as far as like some of the being able to hold uh, muscular endurance, yes. But there are ways that you can delay that, but also keep up the cardiovascular aspect. Um, two ways. One is aqua jogging. Oh, yeah. Uh, which you've, you've been a fan of in the past. I have had, uh, I had a great, exp- a great experience. Well, aqua jogging alone isn't just a great experience, but 2010, uh, I did a race called try 101. Uh, this is like a new race series they had in 2010. It was actually in Sarasota. Um, it, it flopped big time. It was like an in-between. It was like a two mile, a 1.8-mile swim, a 100-mile bike, and an 18-mile run, um, something like that. I, mean, I think a shorter bike. But anyway, so I got up to about seven miles uh, or an hour running. Later that weekend, I went to help a friend move. And if you know me, you know I wear flip-flops year-round. That includes while I'm moving people. <laughs> And twisted my ankle going down the stairs Uh, and had to be put in a brace. I could still swim and ride, but but running was just not going to happen. And I was four weeks out from the race. Uh, I actually aqua jogged um, up until race day and was able to run the whole 18 miles. Huh. Uh, A few things about aqua jogging. You're you're not going to get the... Uh, you're not going to keep the muscular endurance, uh, per se from a, uh, from a resiliency standpoint, like you, cause obviously nothing can replicate running on asphalt or pavement in the, in the water. It's just not, but I could keep up with the movements. You do get a little bit of resistance, you know, running in the water and also with your arms. My arms were like ripped after this. I, I found out because I was, you know, running underwater with that little bit of resistance, um, and I actually went by heart rate. Um, and one thing you always need to remember if you're ever aqua jogging and you, and you choose to use a heart rate monitor um, is if your zone one taps out at like 140, you really need to tap it out at 130 because the water cools yourself. So while it may not feel like you're working as hard, you're still working as hard. It's just, you know, it's a, it's the difference in running on a treadmill with no wind and running outside. You know, it, one's too hot, one's just right. The pool is where you get, like, extra cooling effects. Your body's not having to work as hard to cool itself. Mm-hmm. So you're still doing work. It's just not appearing so in your heart rate. Um, and then I did not use a water belt that, because it was too much uh, for me. So I, I actually purchased, like, really baggy swim trunks. And shoved a pool buoy uh, down the back of my shorts. And that's all I needed. Because it was just enough to where I had to fight to stay afloat, but not to where I was like, all right, this is kind of a joke. Because some of those like water belts they give you, I mean, dear God, like you're, it's like you're 
aqua jogging in the in the Red Sea or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that's the one where that's like real dense. Maybe it's, maybe it's the Dead Sea, but um, oh yeah, yeah go one, ahead. One of those. I, yeah, I, go biblical for a second. But so and so that's what I did for that. And then another aspect before you dip in is walking on an incline. Um, you can really some a lot of times gain fitness uh, by, and not lose any by walking on a treadmill on like really, really steep inclines. No, do not put your hands on the rails. Oh. Um, that's cheating. Um, but walk on, to go walk on an 8% incline and tell me your heart rate doesn't get up and tell me your legs don't hurt after a while. You're not getting that pounding, but you're still a raising your heart rate and b still working out some of uh, your your leg muscles. Okay, that sounds good, man. Uh, um, trying to think what else. Uh, I, I, I just had an offshoot question because you said that about the Red Sea, and it, I was thinking about this the other day. Is there something to the fact that swimming in open water because there's more debris or, or not debris, but like. Uh, what silt or whatever you want to call it? Does it is it more buoyant? Open okay, water? so we'll, we'll do a quick little lesson here. Uh, ocean is salt water. I know that part, but I just meant like okay, a lake. Okay, just something. checking. Yeah, uh, no, I know yes. that. Yes, you are. You are always more buoyant in salt water. I know salt water, but like a lake. Because no, okay, because I just you know, maybe it's in my head, but I feel like no. when I go to a lake, I feel like I there's a, just a not maybe. Huge well, advantage, but just is there some little bit different? I don't know. No, I, I well, first of all, I'd ask you: are, is most of the time you go swim in the lake? Is that with a wetsuit? No. no okay. No. Uh, a lot of times, people just feel faster. Okay. Um, you because everybody feels different in in that kind of environment from a pool because a you're excited. Um, there is no end in sight which I feel like really amps up people's uh, ability to, to try and swim fast. Um, but no, there, there is no buoyancy difference from fresh water and, and um, you know, pool water. In fact, a lot of indoor pools now are going to salt anyway. Um, not as near as much as the ocean, obviously, but I mean, that's why when you wear a wetsuit and you hop in the ocean <laughs> and it's like, dear God, you're like swimming on top of the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so easy to, I mean, you're, that's why you're so much faster because your body positioning is better. You can get a better stroke. Um, you know, it's a, that's a, that's a, a really good one. Uh, I've noticed that when I have a wetsuit, if I ever have my, uh, back in the day when I'd have a lot of these anxiety spots or whatever, if I had a mm-hmm. wetsuit on and I was trying to do my breaststroke, it's really hard to breaststroke with a wetsuit on because you're, it is, it, 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 you're so higher, much higher in the water. I don't know. It's kind yeah, of almost easier well, just to swim. High. Yeah, you, you really are high. It's it's really easier to to get a much. Uh, you also have more, a much a more efficient stroke because uh, you are sitting so much higher in the water. So your leverage it's easier to get on top of your stroke than if your legs are like dangling. Mm-hmm. Um, then your weight is shifted back and you have to get up and over. Um, so that brings a quick question though, because uh, mm-hmm. we talk about pull buoy a lot, and I asked you years ago. I was like, dude, is this like kind of simulating a wetsuit? And you're like, yeah, definitely. And so I'm going, you know, as far as I know, I only have one race scheduled this year and it's going to be wetsuit. And so I'm swimming a lot with a pool, I think. Oh, oh, maybe not, huh? I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, don't, don't always, don't always book it. I'm not booking it, but I kind of am. Yeah. He sounds like you are. (laughs) But, uh, there's gotta be something to be said for being used because I really focus on that position in my um, legs and trying to not, you know, keep them calm and stuff like that. So that would, might be an advantage to practice a lot with a pull buoy when you're doing a wetsuit swim. It, no, it is. And it, for a ton of reasons, for not, not just the ones that you mentioned, but it, you know, I had an athlete that I work with send me tape of them swimming. And one of the first things I noticed was um, it, a, a lot of athletes suffer from an inefficient kick. Um, and that can be just bad coaching, bad understanding of where you should kick from. Like you should kick from your hips, not from your knees. Um, a lot of triathletes come into the sport with bad flexibility because they're a runner. Um, and so they're, it's harder for them to point their toes. 
But what happens a lot is, and I know you, you probably remember this from our open water sessions, is um, the more you thrash with your legs, the more your hips move. Mm-hmm. And if you've got if you've got what I call wiggly hips, uh, your hips totally throw throw off your upper body mechanics. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people that will tell you, like if you if you're a swimmer, you know that there's a huge difference in hip driven freestyle and shoulder driven uh, freestyle. That's how much your hips can play a pivotal role, no pun intended, in your swimming. That that there is a way to swim that's a hip-driven freestyle where they tell you to throw your hips forward. Well, you know, being that your hips are in the middle of your body, wherever your hips go, the rest of your torso goes. And I, I always find that most athletes who suffer from really, really bad uh, you know, they, they can't swim straight for the life of them. Their stroke is usually fine. It's that they wiggle their hips so much. Like I'm right now I'm sitting in my chair and I'm just wiggling my hips and my shoulders are going right, left, right, left, right, left. Well, my arms are attached to my shoulders. So when I take a stroke, although my stroke might be straightforward, if my hips are wiggling, then my stroke is going to be pointed not towards 12 o'clock, but maybe towards like 11 or 1030. Right. Well, that's how you swim crooked. Um, so yeah, then there's, there's a lot of ways and reasons why you should, you should swim with a pool boy. Um, hip control, uh, is one of them, but, uh, I did want to hit quickly, um, with, uh, the, the other two aspects for, um, training through injury you know swimming is one of those where you know i would just hit the weight room uh swimming is hard to hard to replicate if you're injured and honestly if you're injured so bad you can't swim it's probably best to take some time off (laughs) um you know because that's one of those things where like you can almost always swim uh cycling alone you know is one of those things too again if you're if you're have a stress fracture you can usually still swim uh, because it, you just got to do light stuff and really bitch being injured is being about being patient. You know, am I giving up a week to give up 30? Um, you know, and, and looking at the big picture, not the, you know, not the small. And, you know, those are just a few ways that you can, you can train. Obviously if you're suffering through like a nagging this or a nagging that, you know, I, I had an experience, uh, 2013, I think, where you probably remember this, but I was having like really bad Achilles tendonitis yeah. and I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't do much. And so I got a lot of dry needling and, um, my cycling more than kept up with, um, and even improved my run fitness. Um, I remember leading up to, uh, the country music marathon that year, I only ran like seven times in the previous three months because my my Achilles in the nice was so bad, but I was able to bike. And so I just did a lot of big gear stuff, so I was still getting a lot of load and torque on and putting that much-needed strain on my tendons and ligaments and muscles in my legs, but I wasn't damaging myself while running. I ended up running like my best marathon ever, which was like at that point like a 315. And then a few weeks later, <laughs> I did one run in between that and Gulf Coast, and that was the race I, I referenced earlier where I ran my way into the top 10, you know, so, you know, there's, there's definitely a way to do it. You just got to be really smart and always err on the side of caution, mm-hmm. uh, when, when, uh, when doing it. But, um, again, I know I glossed over these topics today, but we will both get into these deeper and then definitely touch on, uh, some of these kind of, you know, human interest pieces, you know, going forward, I've, I've been just, I mean, riveted by some of these people's stories. I know, uh, I know it's good stuff. That have just been I- incredible. Uh, and, you know, and I'd love to even have some of them on. Like, I just, you know, I love hearing how people, um, it, that's been like the common theme, I think. It's like, you know, listening to the average Joe talk about how they do their training and how they, where they came from and, and hearing other people's stories like that, you know, is really, has been really good for me. Um, and I do want to say that, um, I don't know if it was an email or, or, a 
a podcast review, but I think it was a gentleman said like, you know, hey, I love it when you talk about, you know, <laughs> CTL and this and this and this, and um, but nobody else that I know wants to talk about it. So it's like my way of having a conversation with you guys. Yeah. And to me, that like speaks volumes because like how many times, I mean, if you're listening, ask yourself, when was the last time I talked to somebody on the phone for this long? Mm. First of all, if you did, you probably didn't want to because it was like on a work call or something and you wanted to get off. For me, this is the longest conversation I have via phone uh, every week. And so from like connecting with people, which I think is kind of becoming a lost art um, these days because everything is social media and texting. And like for me, from a sales standpoint, like they say, um, emails are the new phone call. Like you don't call people to talk about, you know, sales and stuff because they won't answer. They just want you to either text them or email them. Yeah. And, you know, so we're just losing connection and, and in that uh, um, ability to, like I said, the ability to connect with people. And so th- I loved hearing that because I mean, it, it does that for me. You know, it helps me connect, you know, with you and then obviously through this with other people. Right. Because, I mean, when you get into triathlon, and you really feel like you've uncovered a completely new part of your life and there's a deep passion for it and you're ha- and you know you're on that train daily and you can't kind of get enough and it's rare to have a good conversation with somebody about that stuff i remember when i started i i just couldn't get enough you know you just wanted to have a personal conversation and share your thoughts and just you know, be with somebody like-minded and yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent. Yeah. It's been, cause it's triathlon, been awesome. you know, it's obviously a big part of our lives and real close to us, but you know, most people don't even want to hear about this crap. You know? like, <laughs> well, they don't understand it. They, you'll tell them that you're doing a triathlon and then like a, a day later, they're like, so yeah, I told my friends at work, you're doing like this marathon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're yeah, like, yeah. I just told you that, that I'm not doing that. Yeah. And it involves, um, you know, it's such, it's such a complex sport. Um, and that's why it's so hard for, I think people to, to wrap their brain around it. And, you know, as we saw in like a lot of our emails, that's why it's so scary Mm -hmm. because there are so many moving parts, um, and how to incorporate those into a week. Like, you know, if you're a great cyclist and runner, well, guess what? You might just be terrified of the water mm-hmm. and, or vice versa. You might be a great swimmer and you can't, you can't bike or you don't even own one. You know, there are just so many, um, barriers to entry in the sport that it's why it's so difficult for people to get into, you know, whether it be financial or mental or athletically. Um, and that, that's why I love it. And that's why I really love coaching it. It's because it's so complex. It's, it's honestly, it's like, it's like in a Rubik's cube from a coaching standpoint, like you have to shift one way and shift another and try to get this to line up with this. And a lot of the time it's okay if they don't line up, but ultimately when you get to that race, you want to have clicked and moved right and left up and down to where they all fit together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, triathlon and training for one is like looking at it in a Rubik's cube. You're like, how the hell am I going to connect all these pieces together to be finished? Um, and that's why I enjoy coaching. That's why I enjoy doing this podcast. Yeah. And me too. And it's a learning experience every time. Um, well, I did, like I said I, earlier, um, I was talking to my mom this morning and she really enjoyed the dog cast. So we, yeah, made- I had somebody else text me during this and <laughs> popped up, Hey, great podcast earlier. And I was like, thanks. Hope you like the next one. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I, I promised her that we may, um, Outside of our normal run of uh, Monday, Thursday, we may uh, sprinkle in some dog casts as we go, you know, because okay. I know you have a lot to say about your dog, Kona. Yeah, my dog, man. I was thinking about that the other day, actually, how much, yeah. I, I could definitely do a good five or ten minute cast with my dog. I would just um, break it up a little bit, you know. Throw yeah, little, yeah, yeah. A little something yeah. out there. Yeah, maybe walk around the neighborhood and interview other dogs. That I like that. I like yeah, that. have some guest dogs. Yeah. Analyze the, the 
gate of running gates and all right, that. Right, exactly. There's a lot to learn Joe. from dogs, you know. <laughs> you did touch on, you know, a, a groundbreaking, um, you know, diet, uh, which is the dog food diet. Yeah. You know, earlier on an earlier podcast, is that, is that why, you know, dogs are always so, whatever it was, so yeah. happy or, you know. Energize them. They're just consistent, man. I think, yeah. you know, and CC is always a big fan of that uh, theory. Yeah, yeah, he definitely dives into uh, into your bro science, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as one of our one of our uh, listeners called it. But I do want to give a quick shout out to make sure you're looking forward to uh, our guest Steve Magnus, who's coming on in I think two weeks from tomorrow. Um, Steve is a uh, coaches at the University of Houston track and cross country. He is the co-author of a upcoming book uh, called Peak Performance, um, and he is also a coach to pro runners. Uh, if you don't follow Steve or know anything about him, make sure you look him up. I am beyond pumped to have this man on as a guest, um, and you know we'll probably do like a, a small intro about how to not suck at running, but from a man who has coached Olympic Olympians, uh, from a running standpoint, we may just let him do it for us. Yeah, no kidding, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to yeah. step out of the way. It's all you, man. Exactly. So uh, look him up. Be pumped. He's coming up in a few weeks. Um, but yeah, I think uh, for today, that's all I have. And look forward to uh, the next podcast, How to Not Suck at Cycling, part two. Yeah, I like it. And uh, keep the emails coming in, crushingiron at gmail.com. We're loving them. And like I said, I've been on a, I've been a little busy the last few days, but I've replied a little bit, and I'm going to get back to you more in depth. And I look forward to building friendships with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and let us know, um, you know, I know I'm not on Facebook, but I know you started that closed Facebook group. Two things. One, you know, let us know what races you're doing this year. You know, email us or post on that closed group what race you're doing this year, so we can start to connect more. You know, on a on a personal level, you know, at races, and I know I'm going to really make a concerted effort to be at Ironman Louisville this year, and definitely be uh, at Ironman Wisconsin this year. Um, you know, and so if you're, and I'll, I'll be at Chattanooga 70.3. I have a ton of athletes racing there, and uh, at that point, <clears throat> getting to Ironman in Chattanooga will probably be a little bit easier, but yeah, I mean, let us know what you're doing. I'd love to meet a lot of you in person and get together and, and chat. And then, and then also if you've written us about your personal story and you would be open to being a guest on the podcast, um, Hey, we'd love to learn from you and talk to you more. And I'm sure others would too. So, um, until next time. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for the great reviews on iTunes. They just keep coming in, and we really appreciate that, too. Yep. I'll uh, see you Thursday. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot, man, for uh, working this into your busy schedule. You got it. All right. See you.